All right, let's dive in. U.S. and China, everyone's talking about it, right? But today, we're going deep, beyond the headlines. Trade wars, sure, but it's way bigger than that. Global power, totally different ways of running an economy, high-stakes stuff. Our guide, this book, Cold War 2.0, by Andronic Agazarian. He's got this unique angle. You know, he's looking at it from the perspective of these rising Asian economies, which is fascinating. And he brings in experts like Martin Jacques to really yeah. shake things up. Get ready. This is going to be eye opening. You know what I find interesting? Everyone's fixated on the trade war, but that's really like the symptom. Something way bigger is happening. Imagine like two giant ships changing direction and the wake that's what we're feeling. The whole world is getting tossed around. OK, so before we get to those waves, let's back up a bit. China's economic boom. This wasn't just out of nowhere, no. right? Oh, absolutely not. This has been decades in the making. Very deliberate. Goes back to 78, Deng Xiaoping's reforms. Think about it. A country going from closed off to suddenly, bam, open for foreign investment. Result, economic explosion. Hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty just like that. It's almost hard to grasp that scale of change. Mm -hmm. And it's not just some abstract thing, you know. Think about it. How much stuff do you own that says made in China? This growth, it's impacted all of us, even if we don't always see it. A hundred percent. And that brings up a huge question. What's the end game for China? What are they aiming for? Here's where the experts get really interesting. We've got Martin Jacques in his book, When China Rules the World. Bold title right here. He argues that China's rive, get this, could actually lead to a more democratic global economy. More democratic. That doesn't seem to fit with, well, a lot of what we hear about China. Hmm, right. It seems counterintuitive. But Jacques says... See, China's playing on a different time scale. It's a whole different worldview. A Gazarian calls it like a civilization state. They're playing the long game, thinking in centuries, not just the next election. So not about quick wins, but this slow and steady march to, well, becoming the top dog. Exactly. Then you've got Michael Pillsbury, the 100-year marathon, and he's way more cautious. He's saying, hey, China's got this hidden plan. They want to replace the U.S. as the superpower. Now, whether you buy Jacques' view or Pillsbury's, one thing's for sure, the U.S. is paying attention. And that brings us to the trade war, right? Yeah. And it's gone way past cheap goods or trade deficits. It's about control. Who controls the tech, the intellectual property? Who's going to dominate the future of, like, the key industries? That's the battleground. And you can't forget Trump's campaign in 16. He went hard on China, unfair trade, stealing jobs, messing with their currency, the whole nine yards. And then in office, boom, those tariffs he kept promising, not just talk anymore. In all those tweets, remember, billions flowing back to the U.S. because of the tariffs. Agazarian points out, though, economists looked into it, and a lot of that money, straight into corporate stock buybacks. Didn't exactly trickle down to, like, everyday people. Yeah, so it makes you wonder, right, who's really winning in these trade wars? Is it about American jobs, or is there a different agenda at play? And here's where things get really wild. This whole U.S.-China thing, it's not happening in isolation. It's like, drop a boulder in a pond, the ripples go everywhere. It's a global earthquake. The IMF, they've come out and said it. China's responsible for almost half of global growth. Think about that. So when these two titans clash, the whole world feels the tremors. Europe, Africa, Southeast Asia, everyone's caught in the crossfire. And amidst all this chaos, there's another trend emerging. You see these alternative economic models popping up, the BRICS Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. These aren't the traditional Western-led institutions. This is something different. Yeah, it's like a shift in the power balance, a move away from like the old way of doing things, the Western-dominated globalization. So are we witnessing like the birth of a multipolar world mm -hmm. where power isn't just concentrated in the West anymore? That's a big question. And to answer it, we got to look closer at the trade war itself, the actual impact. Because while all these massive changes are swirling around, there are very real everyday consequences, stuff that hits all of us. Remember that UN report? Alessandro Nisita, he found the trade war caused a 25% drop in imports of all those products hit by tariffs. Ouch, that's got to hurt. Right. But here's the catch. Chinese exporters, they got smart. They lowered prices to stay competitive. So they still managed to hold on to about 75% of their exports. So on one hand, you've got American consumers paying more. And on the other, Chinese producers are making less profit. It's like everyone loses, right? Exactly. It's a lose-lose. And it begs the question, is the trade war really addressing the root cause of the economic imbalance between the U.S. and China? Which is what exactly? Is it just China being sneaky or is there more to the story? Well, you've got economists, big names like Yukon Hong, Martin Feldstein, Joseph Stiglitz. They all point to some fundamental problems within the U.S. economy itself. They're saying, look, 
America's low savings rate, all that government spending, this obsession with consuming, that's what's driving the trade deficit. So it's like blaming your neighbor for using too much water when you've got a leaky faucet in your own house. That's a great way to put it. And the numbers tell the story. China is saving a whopping 47% of its GDP. The U.S. tries 17%. That's a huge gap, and it tells you a lot about how these two countries think about economics. So is the U.S. picking the wrong fight? Instead of focusing on what China is doing, maybe it's time to look inward, fix those internal problems. But that's something for you to think about. Because now we need to get down to brass tacks. What does all this mean for you, the listener? How does this global power struggle, this trade war, affect your life, your wallet, that's exactly where we're headed in part two of this deep dive. We're going to explore what could happen next in this clash of the titans. What does it mean for the future of the global economy? Buckle up. Things are going to get even more interesting. Welcome back to our deep dive into the U.S.-China trade war. Last time we were talking about how this whole thing is like just the tip of the iceberg, right? It's about a huge shift in global power. And it goes way beyond like who's got the biggest economy or the most weapons, you know. It's about who's got the influence, who's setting the rules, who's calling the shots. Yeah, soft power, that's the name of the game. And one of the craziest things we're seeing is like the rise of these alternative economic models. Like the old system's getting a serious challenge. Right. Think about the BRICS Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Developing countries, they've got options now. They don't have to play by the West's rules anymore. And China's right there leading the charge. Oh, absolutely. Agzarian, he dedicates a whole chunk of his book to the Belt and Road Initiative. This thing is massive. It's like connecting Asia, Europe, Africa, all through these roads, railways, ports, pipelines. It's almost like a sci-fi movie, the scale of it. I know, right? And it could totally reshape global trade, power dynamics, everything. The U.S., though, they're not exactly thrilled about it. No, they see it as China's power grab, right? Trying to muscle in on their turf. But for a lot of developing countries, it's a game changer. It's investment. It's a chance to finally catch up. Yeah, totally different perspectives. It all depends on where you're standing. And this is where things get a little uh, tense, because as the U.S. and China, you know, try to one up each other on the world stage. The chances of something going wrong, some kind of miscalculation or even like a, a deliberate escalation, that risk just goes way up. Agazarian uses this crazy analogy. He says it's like the insulation around the U.S.-China relationship, it's gone. The wires are exposed. Any little spark could set the whole thing on fire. So we've got these economic forces at play, but we can't forget about technology. Oh, yeah, that's a whole other battleground. It's not just about trade or like military stuff anymore. It's about AI, 5G, quantum computing, all that cutting edge stuff. Whoever's got the tech... They're going to be in the driver's seat, shaping the future. And this spills over into cybersecurity, data privacy, all of that. It's like a digital arms race on top of everything else. Yeah. It's almost too much to think about. Yeah. So let's get back to the big question. Can the U.S. and China actually, like, coexist peacefully in this new world? Or are we headed for, like, Cold War 2.0, like Agazarian says? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? And honestly, it's tough to say. On the one hand, there's so much potential for them to work together. They've got common problems, right? Climate change, pandemics, nuclear weapons. They need each other, whether they like it or not. Exactly. Their economies are totally intertwined. But then there's all this distrust, this suspicion, this baggage from the past. It's like they're always one wrong move away from blowing everything up. And you can't forget about the people who benefit from all this tension, right? The ones who see the other side as the enemy. The ones who profit from keeping the conflict going. Yeah, that's a whole other layer. So where do we go from here? What are the possible scenarios, the ways this could all play out? It feels like we're at a crossroads. Like, so many different paths we could go down. Some scarier than others. One possibility is maybe the U.S. and China, somehow they figure out a way to get along. They compete, sure but they also cooperate on the stuff that matters to everyone. Maybe they come up with some new rules, a new framework for trade and investment, something that works for this new world. Right. But that would take a lot of compromise, a lot of good faith on both sides. They'd have to, like, step back from the edge and find some common ground. With how tense things are right now, mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine. But hey, I'm an optimist. I gotta have hope. I hear you. Another possibility, though, and this one's not so pretty, is that the rivalry just gets worse and worse. We end up with a world that's divided, fragmented. Like totally separate economic systems, different technology, even military alliances. 
like the old Cold War. Yeah, that's a scary thought, going back to that kind of world, all that tension, that uncertainty. We thought we were past that. And then there's the worst case scenario, the one that nobody wants to talk about. The wild card. A major conflict, a real shooting war over Taiwan, the South China Sea. Who knows what could trigger it? Agazarian's got this saying. He says, no matter how bad things are, they can always get worse. And a war between the U.S. and China, I mean, that would be a disaster for everyone. So what does this mean for you, the listener? What does it mean for all of us? It means we're living in a time of massive change, a time of risk, but also, you know, a, a time of opportunity. The choices the U.S. and China make, the choices we all make, they're going to have consequences. We can't just sit back and watch this happen. We got to be informed. We got to talk about this stuff. We got to push for solutions that work for everyone, promote peace, cooperation, you know. It's heavy stuff, no doubt. But it's important to remember, we're not helpless in all of this. Mm -hmm. We can make a difference, even in small ways. Absolutely. Support businesses that are doing the right thing. Speak up for policies that make sense. Talk to people who see things differently than you do. It all adds up. We can be part of the solution, not the problem. Exactly. And that's what we're going to explore in the last part of our deep dive. What can individuals do? What can businesses do? What can governments do to make things better? To build a better future in this crazy U.S.-China rivalry? Stay tuned. All right, we're back for the final part of our deep dive. It's been a wild ride, right? From China's rise to, like, talk of a new Cold War. It's kind of heavy stuff. Makes you wonder where it all goes, you know? Yeah, I get it. It can feel overwhelming. But the thing is, and Agazarian really drives this point home, we're not just, like, passive observers in all of this. We have a say. We can actually choose a different path, one that leads to a more, you know, stable and cooperative future. Okay, so how do we do that? Where do we even begin? Well, first things first, we got to understand. We got to ditch those oversimplified narratives, the whole us versus them thing that dominates conversation, you know? It's not that simple. Like, we need to take a step back, see the bigger picture. Exactly. China's not this, like, single-minded evil empire or whatever. It's a complicated place, a long history, diverse cultures, different opinions, just like anywhere else. And the same goes for the U.S., right? Yeah. We're not all like war hawks or greedy corporations. There are tons of Americans who are worried about where our foreign policy is headed, who believe in, you know, talking things out, finding common ground. That's where this idea of people-to-people -people diplomacy comes in. Agazarian talks a lot about this. We need more exchanges, more mm -hmm. interaction between everyday folks, students, artists, scientists, business people, you know, from both countries. Yeah, like build those personal connections, those shared experiences. That's how you break down stereotypes, how you start to actually like see the other side as human beings. It's harder to demonize someone when you've like had dinner with them, right. right? Right. And it's not just individuals. Businesses, the ones operating in both the U.S. and China, they've got a big role to play, too. They can really push for constructive engagement, build trust, open up communication channels. Instead of just, like, chasing the next buck, they can use their power to advocate for, I don't know, fair trade practices, environmental protection, human rights, the things that actually benefit everybody in the long run. It's about realizing that, like, we can all win. Economic interdependence, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. You can compete and cooperate. A healthy global economy, that's good for everyone. But at the end of the day, the real responsibility for creating a peaceful world, that falls on governments, right? They got to be willing to sit down, talk, build trust, figure out how to manage their differences without you know, resorting to threats or aggression. Absolutely. And Agazarian's point is we need a new kind of diplomacy, something more creative, more flexible, more focused on the long game. OK, so what does that look like, practically speaking? Yeah. What can governments actually do to build those bridges? Well, for starters, invest in diplomacy itself beef up their diplomatic corps, promote cultural exchanges. And there's this thing called track two diplomacy. It's really interesting. Track two. What's that all about? It's basically like these informal dialogues outside of the official channels. Academics, experts, former officials, you know, people who can speak freely without all, all the government restrictions. They can like plant those seeds of understanding, lay the groundwork for future cooperation. Makes sense. Build relationships, find common ground, work towards goals that everyone shares. Exactly. And when you think about it, the U.S. and China, they have a lot of common goals. Climate change pandemics, nuclear weapons, these are things that no one country can solve on their own. It really drives home the point that, like, in this day and age, global leadership, it's not about being the boss. It's about 
partnership. It's about collaboration. It's about finding solutions that work for everyone. Couldn't have said it better myself. So as we wrap up this deep dive, I just want to leave you with this. The U.S.-China relationship, yeah, it's messy. It's complicated, no doubt. But there's also a ton of potential there. You know? Absolutely. The choices we make now, the actions we take, the words we use, they all matter. It's up to all of us to shape this relationship, to make sure it benefits not just us, but like future generations, too. That's a future worth fighting for. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, folks. Until next time, stay curious, stay engaged, and remember, you can make a difference. We